Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. On behalf of the MIT CDOIQ Virtual Symposium, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have continued to support the symposium during this very challenging year. Before we thank our partners, we'd like to ask that sometime during the symposium's breaks that you visit our partners' virtual booths. You can also visit the content hub on the MIT CDOIQ website for some great partner resources. We'd like to thank the following partners, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy and Analytics, Dowex, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, Tamer, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Boomi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pylog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global IDs, Snowflake, Starburst. And as I said, please make every effort to visit our partners, use the virtual passport, because without them and our partner support, this symposium could not be held. Thank you.
Hi there, everyone, and welcome back to our second keynote. Just a uh, slight update. We had over 900 people uh, log in all over the world to uh, listen to Do Professor Lauren Gardner. So uh, our thanks to uh, Professor Gardner for that outstanding presentation. I know we didn't get all questions, uh, but we have taken a, a list of those. If you go into the uh, presentation, main presentation area and don't see your questionnaire, do not worry. We've archived that. We will, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Gardner said that she's willing to answer additional questions. So we will get back to that. Check out our uh, LinkedIn um, uh, site and uh, check on the website. We'll be posting the updates. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, Digital Minister of Taiwan, uh, Minister uh, Audrey Tang. Now, unfortunately, uh, the time zones don't permit uh, Minister uh, Tang to be live with us. So, uh, as I mentioned at the, uh, the beginning, she's actually presented a uh, recording on how Taiwan has solved or uh, reduced on the impact of COVID, handled the uh, social uh, distancing, contact tracing with, uh, with amazing social digital innovations. So, uh, Minister uh, Dr. Audrey Tang is going to be talking about that. Uh, the minister has pre-recorded a special presentation that shows uh, how Taiwan has conquered the pandemic with no lockdowns or takedowns. You'll hear her mention that. Um, she uses, uh, they, you know, Taiwan has used the fast, fair, and fun approach, the three pillars of social innovation, and she explains that trust was the key to innovation. This session will last a full hour, and unfortunately, due to the time, uh, there will be no uh, questions uh, for, no time for Q&A, but do uh, put your questions in the slider box. We'll archive them and see if uh, the uh, Dr. Audrey Tang has got the ability to answer them on her spare time. So uh, Rod, if you'd like to roll the video, I will let you run that. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share with you how Taiwan countered the pandemic with no lockdowns and how we counter the infodemic with no takedowns. But first, I would like to say that social innovation, that is to say the people who trust each other to innovate on how to improve as we encounter a novel situation, a novel coronavirus in this case, is really the cornerstone of Taiwan's collective intelligence. In Taiwan, we have the fast, fair, fun as the three pillars of social innovation. I'd like to talk first about the fast part. Democracy improves as more people participate and digital technology remains one of the best ways to improve participation, as long as the focus is on listening at scale, not just broadcasting and finding common ground and rough consensus rather than sowing discord. So whereas many economies began countering the coronavirus only this year, in Taiwan, we started last year. And we thank Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan, the whistleblower, who posted that there were seven new SARS cases last year. In the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, there's someone with the name No More Pipe reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's message on um, early morning of December 31st. And it got upvoted so that our medical officers immediately noticed this post and issued an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspections. And that was the first day of 2020. It says to me two things. First, the civil society trusts each other and the government enough to talk about possible new SARS cases in a public forum. And that the government trusts the citizens enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again. It's something that we have been always preparing since 2003. And the reason of this trust is because according to the Civicus Monitor, the Human Rights Watch Group, Taiwan is the most open, indeed the only completely open society in the whole of Asia. 
we enjoy the same freedom of speech, the same freedom of assembly, the same freedom of the press and so on as other liberal democratic countries, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind on novel technologies, because in Taiwan, democracy itself is a technology. We only got to direct presidential election thanks to the late president Li Denghui in 1996. And there's a saying that anything that's invented after we're born is technology. So in Taiwan, we're constantly looking at ways to improve democracy as a set of social technologies. One example, every day our Central Epidemic Command Center during the pandemic holds a live streamed press conference. And the simple collective intelligence system in this case is a toll-free number that is 1922. Anyone with any idea coming in from the civil society can just pick up their phone and dial this number. Not only there's more than 90% chance of it getting picked up, um, you can actually ask anything about epidemiology as well as contributing your thoughts to the CECC daily press conference. For example, it was one day in April when a young boy's family called saying, hey, my boy doesn't want to go to school because their schoolmates may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. You see, when you're rationing mask, you don't get to pick the color. Well, the very next day, everybody in the CUCC press conference started wearing pink medical mask, making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming. And a person in the middle, um, Minister Chen Shizhong, our commander, even said that his favorite childhood icon was the pink panther. And this kind of fast response builds trust between the government and the civil society. Another focus here is fairness. For example, when we ramped up the facial mask production, making sure that everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies, fairness is the guiding principle. But the system to distribute the mask was not a government technology project. In the beginning, it's a GovZero project. In Taiwan, for each government website that always ends in something that gov.tw, for example, our national participation portal uh, is join.gov.tw, the civil society, the civic hackers can always change the domain name from the O to a zero. So once you do this change in your browser bar, you get into the shadow government that uses the same data, the same ideas, but take it to a different direction. And we call it forking the government, important pronunciation, fork the government. Fork means not erasing what's already there, but taking it to a new exciting direction. And because the GovZero movement always relinquish the copyright of the um, work, actually mostly using the MIT license, people can very easily change that source code also to try different variations. And at the end, if there's something that's uh, really liked by the general public, the government can always take it in. One example is that there is this map that was created by Howard Wu or Wu Jiangwei from Tainan City. In early February, he observed that when people go to the nearby stores for mask purchase, there's no telling which store runs out of masks and which store still have them in stock. So instead of relying on social media, uh, which may not be uh, up to date uh, and also is quite chaotic, he created uh, this map similar to the Ushahidi map where people can voluntarily report uh, which convenience stores, uh, which pharmacies uh, near their places still have masks or whether they run out of masks. The only problem about this is that, um, well, because he used the Google API, soon um, the API usage uh, is astronomically high, so he cannot afford to run it anymore. So he joined um, the GovZero movement's Slack channel, asking, uh, are there better ways um, to cache the result or to use OpenStreetMap or use some other technology to uh, relieve uh, him of the budget burden? Now, I'm one of the people in the GovZero Slack channel 
that contributed to the discussion. And it occurred to me that this system is much better than the system that we posted online from the government side about the availability of masks. So I just went to the premier, Su Jun Chang, saying, hey, this young person here has a much better idea of how to visualize the mask availability, and we need to do all we can to support him. And this is what I call reverse procurement. In traditional procurement, the government sets the specification and the citizens, the economic sector, implements it. But here, the social sector sets the expectation, the specification. The economic sector, such as Google, eventually waived the API usage fees. And at the end, the public sector's role is just to implement what the social and economic sector wants in a way of realizing the real-time API of our National Health Insurance Agency to make sure that everybody gets access to the level of mask availability in each pharmacy. There were more than 6,000 of them every 30 seconds. And that's why people can participate in accountability when they're queuing in line. Everybody can look at the map or the chatbot or voice assistants. There's more than 100 different applications of the same open data in API form. And if they um, swipe their NHI card and go to a pharmacy who shows at this moment uh, 58 adult mask available, um, then they would expect that after the uh, person before them uh, swipe their NHI card and collect nine medical masks, then uh, 58 minus nine, uh, that would be 49. And so um, everybody would then expect that this sort of like distributed ledger, because each uh, map visualization, each toolkits provider have a copy uh, of the real-time API um, to be consistent. But if instead it doesn't go to 49, but go to, I don't know, 60 or something, uh, they will call 1922 right there. And so this participatory accountability makes sure that a pharmacist uh, earn the trust by opening up their real-time stock uh, and the civil society earn each other's trust by making sure that each transaction is indeed fair. And because the NHI, the National Health Insurance, covers more than 99.99% of not just citizens, but also residents, people who show any symptoms will then be able to take the medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing that they will get treated fairly and without incurring any financial or social burden. And this also enabled the civil society to build dashboards. In this dashboard, we see that we're uh, indeed ramping up the medical mass production. This is the uh, point where we uh, switched from uh, distributing three masks uh, for adults per week um, to nine medical masks per two weeks. And so, um, the supply is indeed growing and people can see it in real time. And there are also people who analyze this and shows us where in Taiwan do we have an oversupply or undersupply. And the pharmacist also uh, has real-time feedback on the kind of supply levels and the people's queuing behavior and so on. And they can always report it in the real time so that they receive supplies as well as the ordering system is always co-created with the entire society. And based on this analysis, uh, we saw that even though that we reached about 75% of people collecting medical masks and using it regularly, um, the numeric model shows uh, us that to uh, reduce the R0 value to be uh, under one, it's not enough to only have like 70% of people actually wearing the mask. We need to get to more than 75%, uh, ideally 80%, so that the R value will be under one. So we asked the remaining one quarter of population and um, based on the dashboard and the focus group, they told us that many people who work uh, in the science parks, like near the Taiwan Semiconductor Company um, in Xinju uh, or uh, in the financial sectors uh, in the Taipei or new Taipei cities, they work very long hours, uh, actually a longer working hour than a pharmacist. And so before, when we only rationed through the 6,000 pharmacies, they could miss the mask 
um, collection simply because, well, after they went off work, everybody from the pharmacies have already um, went home. And so uh, we need to ensure fairness of all kinds. And that's when we started uh, in early March to work with convenience stores, which opens 24 hours a day. And we use the NHI app, which can validate that you are indeed the person uh, that registered in the NHI using the mobile provider's um, TWID um, identification so that you can authorize that app, um, the access to your SIM card. And if your SIM card is registered to your name and it matches your NHI card, then you can use that app as your NHI card and pre-order the mask to your nearby convenience store. And so you see our premier, Su Zhen Chang, smiling very happily here. And that's because that's the day we started working with convenience stores. And because um, the convenience stores also served many people, um, there's more than 12,000 of convenience stores. And then they also joined this co-creation, telling us that uh, even though that this moved um, the mask availability well above 80%, there's still like 10% or so who could not access the service either because they do not have a mobile phone, um, like they're uh, of the very elderly and they could not queue in the pharmacy either, or um, maybe they're um, migrant workers who do have a national health insurance card, but do not have the mobile phone to their name. Maybe they use prepaid SIMs and so on. And so um, in early April, we further improved the system so that anyone with the NHI card can just go to any kiosk in their nearby convenience store, insert the NHI card to pre-order to the same convenience store to collect it a week afterwards. And that's when we um, distribute the mask to more than 95% of the population. And so we ensure fairness of all kinds. And I would also like to share the fun part in fast, fair, and fun because this is a stressful time and people do feel anxious. There was a lot of panic buying, a lot of conspiracy theories. And in Taiwan, our counter disinformation strategy is based on this simple idea. It's called humor over rumor. One example, when there was panic buying of tissue papers, there was a rumor that says, and I quote, there is uh, a same material of the medical mask that's being um, produced in the tissue paper factories. And they, these were being rationed out to the medical mask production facility. So we will very soon run out of tissue papers, unquote. Of course, that's not true. The tissue papers and the medical masks are not of the same material, but because this travels out outrage, um, it maybe has a R value of three like every hour, uh, on average, each person would share to three uh, people on social media. And so there was panic buying. And the same premier you saw smiling in the previous slide, after not even two hours, wrote this meme out. And in this internet meme, in this picture, um, the premier Su Zhen Chang shows his backside, wiggles his bottom a little bit, and say in very large print, each of us only have one pair of Botox. And it's a wordplay because in Mandarin, uh, tun to stockpile sounds the same as tun uh, Botox. Um, and so um, this is, of course, hilarious. Many people laughed about it. Um, and because this travels on joy, uh, on humor, uh, it has maybe a R value of five. Um, so even if this rolls out after the original conspiracy theory, after a day or two, this reached more people. And there's also a table here that says, um, you know, the tissue papers came from South American materials, but then the medical masks came from domestic materials. So they're completely different. There is no need to panic buy. And of course, people who laughed about this specific meme is literally unable to feel outrage because well, that they've laughed about it and the fact checking can then uh, enter the effect. And so we finally found out the people who spread the conspiracy theory in the first place, and they were tissue paper resellers. Uh, anyway, this was not just a single shot point uh, in the social media. This kind of uh, vaccination um, of the mind is very important in our CECC daily press conference as well. 
You see, in each ministry, there is、uh, a team of what we call participation officers or POs, just like media officer that talks to the journalist and the parliamentary officer that talk to the MPs. The、uh, participation officers talk to hashtags. Whenever there's a trending, emerging hashtag, such as the conspiracy theory about tissue papers, the participation officer need to engage the hashtag instead of inviting the representative. There's no representative for most hashtags. One would just join, engage the hashtag,、um, and to share hilarious memes that always is inviting and make sure that scientific、uh, humor, the clarification, spreads easier and wider. And invites people to co-create it, and so our Ministry of Health and Welfare's participation officer lives with this dog, this Shiba Inu,、um, and the name is Zong Chai or the dog CEO. That translates the physical distancing signs、um, on the、uh, top left corner.、Uh, for example, if you're outdoor, you have to keep two Shiba Inu away from one another. If you're indoor, you need to keep Three dogs away from each other, or the sanitation,、um, hand sanitation, important.、Uh, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Don't do what this、um, dog does.、Uh, or remember to pre-order your mask. But why don't um, you um, just uh, wear the mask?、Uh, because wearing a mask is not very useful unless you also wash your hands with soap. And so、um, we always connect the two memes together. And so you order the mask in order to protect you from your own unwashed hands, and this is what this picture is saying.、Uh, like、um, the mask is here to protect you from your own hands,、um, and please use a soap to wash your hands much more diligently. And so that's how we make sure that Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. So this is the pandemic part, and now,、uh, based on this humor over rumor idea, I would like to talk a little bit about the infodemic part. In Taiwan, we ensure that there's always timely response from rumor to humor.、Um, on average, each ministry can now produce such memes under an hour or so. The maximum is two hours. We have the triple two rule. That says whenever there's a trending、um, disinformation that's intentional public harm or just misinformation that people were misinformed. Regardless, if this is something that a minister can clarify, then we need to clarify it at most after two hours, and with two pictures, with less than two hundred characters, and this so that it can fit the screen on a mobile phone. Making sure that even though it's two hours later,、uh, we can have a higher R value that travels on joy rather than something that travels on outrage and that can vaccinate against the outrage. So one example. So you see、uh, Premier Su Jinchang, and now you see another picture of him when he was young. This was made to counter a rumor that says, and I quote, "Perming your hair." Will be subject to one million dollar fine starting next week if you do it more than once a week. Unquote. Now, of course, this would travel an outrage, and so very quickly,、um, the premier rolls this out that says it's not true, and not only it's not true. This part says even though I may be bald now, I will not punish people who look like my youth. And this part, the fine print says, well, we have introduced. It's a labeling requirement for hair products, and that only takes effect starting 2021. However, the fun part is here. The premier,、uh, as he looks now, says, "However, if you keep perming your hair many times a week, even though there's no fine, your hair will be not so fine. Just look at me、uh, for what may happen to you." Now, again, this is. Very humorous,、uh, and he makes fun of not other people but himself. And so this kind of humor appeals to all age groups, all pe people with all different political affiliations, and so on,、uh, who consider this hilarious always.、Um, and so very quickly, if you search on search engine or social media or trending hashtags,、um, you see this clarification rather than the 
misinformation. So response, comedic response um, in real time, that is very important. Now, of course, people may ask, so how did you discover what is trending? It, because people uh, who share something like misinformation or people who deliberately sow discord or disinformation don't always have a higher than one R value. Uh, and if they don't, well, it won't go viral. And if it doesn't go viral, it doesn't make sense for us you know, to keep responding to each one. So how to tell the R value of the mimetic virus um, from the very early on? Well, again, we rely on collective intelligence. In Taiwan, there's a lot of communities, such as the COFAX community, which is also a G0, a G0V project that works very diligently to look at the end-to-end -end encrypted channels that's like uh, Line or WhatsApp. And people, of course, uh, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so only the people who receive the message uh, can see it, but they can dedicate, they can donate, that is to say forward that message to the bot, to the COFAX bot. And um, in the economic sector, Trend Micro, Taiwan's leading antivirus company, also provides a doctor message bot. But whichever bot uh, you trust, uh, at the end, all the uh, disinformation or misinformation packages forwarded to the bot uh, will be published um, like a spam house, a clearing house for email spam and sent to the international fact-checking network, a set of journalistic organizations that works on fact-checking. And just like spam house may rate each incoming sender's um, signature as spam or not spam. And if it's spam, of course, it goes into the junk mail folder uh, rather than our inbox. The IFCN also publishes publicly the reports about fact-checking of the most trending rumors. And so the COFAC or Dr. Message uh, line bot works with the Taiwan Fact Check Center, um, MigoPen, many of them are part of this uh, international fact checking network. And so we work um, in an international setting, making sure that it's professional journalists, not uh, civil servants doing the fact checking. The civil service uh, nevertheless can provide the real time access for the fact checkers. And when the fact checkers publish it, we can also help to make it more funny. Um, and so this uh, symbiotic relationship puts the power of fact-checking ultimately to the journalism and to uh, people who run the internet governance um, systems of multi-stakeholder discussions uh, rather than relying on any specific law. In Taiwan, we never um, passed any law about spawn management. All we did was uh, working through the social norms, making sure that this multi-stakeholder setting um, convinces every uh, internet platforms is that it really is in everybody's best interest to introduce flagging as spam and the spam house protocols. And the same goes for this information and um, the discovery of it. Now, of course, um, as election draws near in any uh, jurisdiction, the level of intentional disinformation grows it's not uh, just unintentional misinformation anymore because disinformation has this um, capability to mobilize people in a outrage to um, motivate political behavior. And in Taiwan, um, we witnessed that in the 2018 mayoral election, there were a lot of precision targeted um, advertisements, um, so-called dark patterns um, that target specific population and lead them to believe um, untrue things uh, that would then discourage them to vote or to um, make uh, them see um, certain politicians and so on, or even the democratic process itself, the voting process itself um, as not trustworthy. And so um, we can't have that, especially when we see many of the advertisement money um, in that case were paid outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, and that uh, is interference in the election. And so um, in 2018, that's also the first year that our control branch, the control yuan, which is a separate government branch from the administration and legislation, um, published the, their audit reports of the campaign donation and expenditure for the first time as op open data. So all of them uh, it, as raw data has uh, each incoming and each outgoing 
finance declaration of the electoral campaign of all the mayoral and city councilor um, candidates. And notably missing in those um, records are social media advertisements. And so then we talked to Facebook, um, to Google, to the social media company saying, look, um, you have two choices. Either you can work with our new norm, the control your norm, and publish in real time as open data, structured raw data of your advertisement library of all the social political advertisements paid um, targeting Taiwanese people during our election season. Or, well, you may face social sanction. So again, we did not rely on any specific law. We just convinced uh, that the uh, multinational companies, uh, as well as our domestic platforms, such as PTT, that it really is in everybody's interest if we work with the control UN norms. That norm, by the way, uh, was uh, made into existence by an act of civil disobedience from the Gap Zero people um, who went to the control UN, um, asked for photocopies, because that was the only form available before 2018, uh, and run this crowdsource OCR campaign like a CAPTCHA uh, and published these um, in a kind of guerrilla way. Um, and the control UN, of course, said uh, you can't be sure that all these OCR, otaku, uh, character recognition are correct. And the GovZero said, well, you need to publish the really correct data then. Uh, and of course, they started doing so last year. So um, because of this uh, mandate from the social sector and the collaboration from the public sector, people this time in the economic sector, Facebook and so on, uh, finally agreed that for the presidential election uh, this year, um, they published all the uh, political social media advertisements, and they also banned foreign-sponsored um, propaganda, that is to say, uh, targeted advertisements uh, on their platform. And Google and Twitter simply refused to run um, such um, advertisement during our election season. So that was a success. And so here, again, investigative journalism is uh, paramount. The Reader Plus, uh, for example, used this kind of open data to connect the MPs and the campaign donors roster. And in real time, if any MP uh, candidates try any dark pattern uh, like we saw in the mayoral election, well, they would get discovered, publicly shamed uh, within a couple of hours. I'm sure. And so because of that, nobody tried that um, in our uh, pre previous presidential election. And so it was very successful. So now I'm going to share uh, with you like three actual disinformation or misinformation. Uh, actually, I think these are all disinformation um, that uh, illustrates our uh, counter infodemic principles. And <clears throat> again, I must uh, stress that there is no administrative Take down. In Taiwan, a journalist's word is worth exactly the same as a minister's word. Uh, and so nothing in the administration can force a journalist or indeed anyone on social media um, to change uh, what they have said uh, or to take it down. However, we can attribute it publicly. So one of the examples that you see here um, is the uh, 204 uh, report of the Taiwan Fact Check Center. And it says, and I quote, Hong Kong sucks compensation exposed, killing a police, earning you up to 20 million. And this was posted um, in 2019, uh, around November, at the heat of our presidential election. And why would that uh, disinformation campaign occur? That was because that was the single most important issue in our presidential election about whether we support people fighting for democracy in Hong Kong or whether we distance from them. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, this disinformation payload actually used a legit photo. And the photo here is from Reuters that says, a teenage um, extradition bill protester is seen uh, during a march uh, to um, demand democracy and political reform in Hong Kong, China. However, the version that spreads in the Taiwanese social media has a different caption, even though it's the same photo. And it says, and I quote, this 13-year-old thug bought new iPhones 
game consoles, brand names for shoes, etc. And he is recruiting his younger brothers, unquote. And so obviously this is a um, repackaging to um, make Taiwanese people feel more distant uh, from the people in Hong Kong. But as I said, we cannot do an administrative takedown. And because of that, we work with the social media companies. And I'm happy to see that Twitter uh, is now also joining. Um, but at the time, Facebook, for example, would post this public notice to all people who share this uh, on the social media if they use the right-hand side picture. And the um, public notice simply said that please read the Taiwan Fact Check Center's report that traced the original poster of this new caption uh, to Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei Chang Anjian, which is the political and law unit of the PRC's um, political and law unit. And so that's it. Like they, of course, still enjoy freedom of speech um, in Taiwanese social media. We just want to make sure that Taiwanese people are aware um, that this new caption was not authored by Reuters or a journalist, but rather authored uh, on the Weibo account of the Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei Chang'an Jin. And, and so that's the idea of a notice and public notice. Another uh, case in point. Um, so during the voting for the presidential election, there was, again, a um, disinformation that says, and I quote, the CIA made two special invisible ink for ballots. So no matter how you vote, Tsai always wins, end quote. The idea is that if you vote for someone else, the ink you use will slowly disappear. And uh, another invisible ink in Tsai's place will magically appear. Now, how to counter this, this information? Well, again, we worked with the civil society on collective intelligence and radical transparency. Because in Taiwan, the ballots, when these are counted, uh, we don't have e-ballots for our presidential election. We have them for i-voting and some participatory budgeting, but not for voting for people. Uh, and so when these uh, ballots are being taken out from the counting ballot box, um, actually the uh, people who uh, help the elections uh, are allowed to film it from the seats uh, of the election watch. And so many popular YouTubers joined their local uh, counting process uh, where the counter uh, will just show each ballot to each angle so that the YouTubers um, have plenty of footage and they have their own tallying app, as you can see on the top left corner, um, that uh, emphasizes the importance of democracy as a social participation um, ritual, really, <laughs> that makes sure that people can trust each and every vote. So if there are invisible uh, ink, or if there are ballots with this suddenly disappearing um, ink, of course, it will very quickly get notified uh, by um, the uh, party candidates um, into all the counters um, that the, all the YouTubers um, in the counting stations. And of course, after receiving the notification from their app, they will of, of course look specifically for it. And that's what happened. And even though like many people look for it, nothing like that uh, ever happened. And so no matter which president candidate do people vote for, they can see before their own eyes or through a YouTuber that they trust that the counting process is indeed fair. And there's no invisible ink one way or another. Again, radical transparency as a way to earn trust and participatory accountability in the form of broadcasting directly from the accounting stations. Uh, finally, uh, the third that I would like to share with you. So when Howard Wu was rolling out the mask map on the very same day, um, there was this rumor that says, now even with money, people cannot buy medical masks now. And I quote, this manufacturer sponsored 2,000 boxes of masks. Get a box for free by sharing this post and increasing the R value, end quote. Um, of course, people who share this uh, message did not get medical mask, but they get phishing emails. That is to say, they get uh, cybersecurity threats um, and virus 
instead of uh, medical masks. And again, um, the way to fix this problem is not by taking down such conspiracy theories because these are just symptoms. The way we counter it is on the very first day of the medical mask rationing system through the National Health Insurance Agency, we made sure that people can access it through the chatbots, such as the Ji Guan Jia, the Center for Disease Control chatbot that has more than, I think, 2 million uh, people using it in the very first day. Uh, and altogether, on the first week, these tools reach more than half of population. And each of them who saw this um, mask availability is then immune to the kind of phishing um, conspiracy theories uh, about a random manufacturer, um, you know, trading your uh, private information details uh, to the promise of the medical mask that never delivers. Rather, this one always delivers. And because everybody has a national health insurance card, they can also check the availability themselves by asking the pharmacist and so on. And so again, participatory accountability through essentially a distributed ledger technology make sure that everybody feels calm and also collect it. And here is again the dashboard at the time. So um, to counter this information, I think this is important that we look at it also from a epidemiologic perspective, that we need to achieve universal health coverage, making sure that everybody gets educated in the way of not media literacy, but media competence, making sure that people can contribute to the fact checking leading to the presidential platform or uh, debate. Um, there's thousands of people who work with institutional media as kind of amateur volunteer media um, in fact checking. And we need to support such as COFAC and Dr. Message and Michael Penn and Taiwan Fact Check Center and so on uh, in the research and development to the affordable vaccination, that is to say the fact-checking report, how to make it easy to understand and also fun. And finally, during the elections, we also need to make sure that there's a strict quarantine barrier from the um, international side so that foreign money um, cannot buy domestic advertisements when it comes to the election season. And with all three, we're very happy to report that even during the pandemic, when the people's anxiety are the highest, we don't have society crippling conspiracy theories uh, and people remain very calm and collected uh, so that we can co-create our counter coronavirus without suffering from this infodemic. Um, and next, I would like to share something uh, that Dr. Tsai ing um, our president said during her first inauguration speech. She's on her second term now. But on the first term inauguration speech, she says something that I consider very inspiring. She said, before we think of democracy as clash between opposing values, but now we need to think of democracy as conversation between many diverse values. And indeed in public uh, administration, there's many people who thought that the government is like this rope in between. For example, one side may be the economic sector want to develop industry, and the other side may be the people caring about the environment and the sustainability, uh, and there were intention of, um, against each other, and it's the public servants in the middle uh, that need to absorb all the tension. Or maybe one side are the innovators that would like to disrupt um, the society using their new AI um, inventions, uh, and the other side, of course, is people who care about social justice, about access to fair opportunity, and so on, and who will then uh, want to regulate um, these disruptive inventions. And again, the government would be in the middle. But um, previously, uh, when each innovation still have a person, a representative uh, speaking, uh, either as a leader of a union or a leader of a association, leader of a um, parliamentary group or so on, uh, that was manageable. But nowadays, as I said, the hashtag doesn't have a spokesperson. And so our participation officers need to use a different way to think about the governance when it comes to the digital age. And this is COGOF, co-creative collaborative governance. And <clears throat> what you're looking at here is my office, literally my office. 
is the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei City. It's uh, next to the Jianguo Flower Market, uh, and it's literally a park. We tore down all the walls so people can just walk in and enjoy um, the people working. For example, this public art uh, is the um, work of people with Down syndrome, with treatment differences. Turns out that when we look at the world, of course, we see data, or your data offices, of course, we see data, um, and then we see the mathematical structures, and we see the physics, and so on. But people with Down syndrome, they see um, the world as geometric, as topological connections. So when they draw out um, in their mind, uh, their uh, thought processes uh, into art, um, it's like Van Gogh's paintings. Suddenly people will feel very creative. And so instead of treating them as vulnerable groups of people, the social innovators in Taiwan make sure that a society can benefit from their unique perspective. And so uh, the Social Innovation Lab um, is basically the place where people can make sure that these kind of social innovation can amplify through this um, design of more than 12 ministries um, residing here. And also uh, every Wednesday, anyone can have 40 minutes of my time or um, a little bit shorter if you're walking. Uh, but um, all I ask is that we publish uh, as video or as a transcript of uh, after 10 days of co-editing everything that we have said. And so this kind of open innovation may show that when people from MIT, uh, I think this is a media lab project called Persuasive Electric uh, Vehicles or the PEV. Uh, and these PEV makers uh, went to me, uh, I think quite a few times uh, around three years ago saying that minister, um, we have this electric vehicles that drives by itself, but we're not quite sure um, what, what they're good for. Uh, and like, sure, the Social Innovation Lab is an open space, and you can just uh, put your PEVs here and see how the market, literally the Jianguo flower market, um, reacts to it. Well, so I was there um, many times. Uh, I remember a time where an elderly couple from the Jianguo flower market holding some orchid flowers um, in small pots uh, and asking me, Minister, what are you doing with these shopping carts? I'm like, these are not shopping carts. These are self-driving vehicles. You uh, hop on one, it drives you places. And they're like, well, they look like shopping carts. Uh, and they tried putting their uh, orchid flowers in it, in the basket, and it worked. And they said, oh, we don't need uh, a self-driving vehicle that drives us places. Um, tai Taipei has pretty good um, taxi and metro and other public transportation. But they say, well, in the Jianguo flower market, it's very crowded. We would like a shopping cart that follows us around so that we can do hands-free shopping, that we would just buy something, put it in the basket. And when it's full, uh, they heard about platooning. So it would step back and then invite something, um, another um, PEV, and form a fleet. Well, to uh, work with this kind of um, work, it need to look different. And so um, you see people from the MIT Media Lab, um, I think that's built in, uh, and yours truly, uh, trying out new designs in the Social Innovation Lab with the help of people um, uh, in the um, Taipei Tech that's just nearby. Because this is open source and open hardware, we were able then uh, to add on some eyes um, and these eyes would show uh, other people who they are following, uh, who they are looking at, um, and to make it a much more pro-social <laughs> rather than anti-social, like not a cyclop, uh, so that it will fit in with the rest of people in the Jango flower market and also in the social innovation lab. And this is what I call a norm-first innovation strategy. We make sure that we first include people in the real society, co-creating the norm on which that these PEVs um, can work with the society. And then we co-domesticate with the entire city. So nowadays, um, my grandma, uh, who's in her um, eight, 80s, um, actually just uh, told me that uh, she just tried a self-driving vehicle in New Taipei City, uh, and it worked really well. Uh, and the same thing that we learned from this uh, PEV uh, are also getting translated um, into the uh, bus that uh, works in the after midnight hours when Metro stopped working, also in Taipei City. So there's dozens of sandbox experiments like this 
happening in Taiwan, always with a norm first uh, philosophy. In uh, sustainable development goal SDG terms, that's target 1717, encouraging effective partnerships. So uh, every year we hold a annual presidential hackathon, making sure that people from all walks of life can amplify their ideas into national agenda. And the award of presidential hackathon is this micro projector. Each year we give out five to uh, domestic teams. We also have an international track, but for domestic teams, um, each recipient, when they turn on the micro projector, that is the trophy, there's no prize money, there's just this trophy. The trophy projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's image. The president herself uh, says, okay, whatever you have created in the past three months as a prototype, we promise that we will make it our national policy, our national direction in the next 12 months. So that's executive presidential power as a hackathon prize. And so there's many uh, innovations such as uh, these people from um, Taiwan Water Corporation using assistive intelligence or AI to make sure that they don't have to keep listening to the pipes that are not leaking. They can concentrate their time on the pipes that are actually leaking and the machine learning, the deep learning reduced uh, the time it takes to um, detect uh, leaking pipes from two months to two days. And there's also innovations such as for remote islands using telemedicine to make sure that instead of asking each um, time that uh, there's a serious like major trauma and so on uh, to fly via helicopter to the main Taiwan island, um, people in the say uh, Orchid Island um, can have a high bandwidth connection with the um, helicopter dispatch and also with the specialized doctor in the main Taiwan island and with the local doctor or nurse performing the instructions from the specialized doctors, they can win the trust from the local people, making sure that um, they are uh, trusted by the local people and they don't have to send every patient through helicopters. We also change our telemedicine laws for that. Or for example, um, people who care about here you see air quality, water quality, and so on, can form data collaboratives that make sure that the citizen scientist can work with institutional scientists and share the same data service platform on our CI, um, civil IoT, Taiwan.gov.tw, so that if you go to uh, the CI, the Taiwan platform, you can see very clearly that um, people of um, social sector, economic sector, and the public sector are working on the same set of data to make sure not only that we can send advanced earthquake warnings uh, through SMS to the people who would likely be affected, we can also warn people um, who are going to be affected by a flood um, in a advanced warning before a typhoon hits and so on. And these, by the way, gets repurposed during the pandemic as the digital fence system that works with what people already understand, which is cell phone tower triangulation and SMS messages, rather than uh, forcing them to install an app or turn on the GPS. So again, we use the data collaboratives that are trusted because it's co-created with civil society um, for counter pandemic purposes. And um, one of the most popular maps uh, from Finjian Kiang, Jiang Minzong in Tainan City was also um, basically repurposing this air quality map uh, to show mask availability. The air quality map you see here um, that went back quite a few years ago, um, all the thousands of points here are done by people who volunteer their schools, like primary school teachers, their balconies and so on um, to measure like PM 2.5, the air quality and share it to a distributed ledger so nobody can go in time to modify the records. And so the great thing about this is that, um, well, the more people are worried about air quality, the more people would then set up such inexpensive, less than 100 US dollar stations and the collaboratives that they form is democratically governed, it's making sure that they have the social mandate so they can talk to the environment minister saying, 
hey, um, we would like you to check our numbers and uh, calibrate the numbers, uh, making sure that our um, machines work in high humidity uh, days and so on. But in return, we would like you to fill in the gaps, the places around here uh, that doesn't have a uh, measurement device. Well, that was because these are industrial parks or private um, lands that, uh, of course, the primary school teachers cannot break and enter and install. Uh, and so it turns out we own the lamp in those municipal governments, uh, as well as in the science parks, industrial parks. So we just use their design and then added such uh, weather stations, micro weather stations in the industrial areas, again, contributing uh, like a puzzle um, from all the different sites to make sure that we not only educate our K-12 um, students in data stewardship, uh, which is very hard to teach from a consumer's perspective, but very easy if they start uh, running, operating their own air boxes. And the global citizenship and sustainable development like climate science is also a major um, curriculum item in Taiwan. And we also work with anyone across the world that decides to download the air box and run it locally on a Raspberry Pi or on a Arduino. And so each time, whenever we run a presidential hackathon, um, there's a lot of AI times CI um, or extended intelligence teams uh, that augments the collective intelligence um, into all sorts of different sustainable development goal targets. And where do we find the people uh, who want to propose such presidential hackathon uh, items? Well, we empower people who are closest to the pain. I personally, every other week or so, go to the most remote places, most rural indigenous lands, remote islands, and so on. And I go by myself. And I join uh, their town halls and stay for a couple of days uh, on an ethnographic hangout, uh, and uh, sometimes with uh, a cultural translator uh, for the indigenous language. There's more than 20 national language in Taiwan, uh, most of which indigenous. And we make sure that the people for them is just another town hall. But when I join the town hall, helping to facilitate, I bring with me um, all the 12 ministries, section chiefs or higher, uh, from the social innovation lab in two-way video conferencing. And so it makes sure that people who talk about things um, can be listened in its entirety in a context, ensuring responsive and inclusive decision-making because all the 12 ministries would then listen to the entire story instead of just a few abstractions. And whenever there's new ideas, like during the presidential hackathon, that need to uh, break existing regulations a little bit, we arrange a sandbox where they can do so for like um, three months, six months, or up to a year, and try their new forked version of the regulation. If it's a good idea, then it will become our regulation. If it's a bad idea, well, everybody learned a little bit. Again, in a risk-contained way, this is how we work um, to make sure that knowledge sharing and collaboration and science and innovation benefits the entire society. And finally, when I say it's a good idea, well, what is a good idea? For example, was UberX a good idea? Well, in 2015, we used the AI power conversation system, POLIS, which is now a part of Taiwanese government. There's polis.gov.tw, uh, a open source software becoming um, polis.gov.tw that shows uh, through K-means clustering uh, and pr principal um, dimension re reduction, the PCA, principal component analysis, making sure that everybody can see where they stand when it comes to the feeling part on the emerging technology. This is the actual map that we showed on the UberX case. And so we first present people with facts, open data from all sectors. And then we use police to ask people's feelings. There's no right or wrong for the same fact. I can feel happy, they can feel angry, and it's all okay. And after those uh, feelings gets resonating with each other, then we can say the best ideas are the idea that take care of people's feelings. And finally, we turn them into decisions. And so the experience of POLIS is like this. You can see one sentiment from your fellow citizen, like passenger liability insurance, very important for UberX. If you agree, you would move toward me a little bit. If you disagree, you will move um, um, afar. However, uh, there's no reply button. So there's no point for trolling. 
that you can't control uh, it without a reply button. So you can just share what you feel with each other. And after three weeks, we always get this picture. And this may be the most important picture of this entire hour of talk. Instead of the institutional and some antisocial social media would lead us believe that we live in a polarized world. Actually, most people agree with most of each other on most of the things most of the time. And this is not something about the Taiwanese culture. This picture I'm showing here is from Bowling Green, Kentucky. No matter people uh, who identify as Democrats or Republican, everybody agree that in addition to science, technology, engineering, and math, we need to add art to it. And so, I mean, this is such a um, simple consensus, but if the uh, people really care about it, using polis, they can discover that we're not that different from each other after all. And that is the basis of the democratic policy. So we further develop the measurement of progress, our KPI is set by the crowd using an API. So uh, finally, I would like to share with you uh, my job description. As you um, can see from my presentation, I'm more of a innovation space in the middle that would enable people who care about different sustainable development goals to co-create common values and deliver innovation that moves these values forward. And in SDG terms, these are reliable data, 1718, effective partnerships, 1717, and open innovation, 176. And when I became the digital minister four years ago, um, the SDGs were really new. Uh, and so the HR department asked me to translate these uh, into plain English. And that's my job description. I will read it to you now as a conclusion. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Believe it or not, uh, at the beginning of the call, I mentioned that due to the time frame that uh, uh, Minister Audrey Tang would not be able to join us, but it turns out that she's actually on Slido. So if you've got any questions, what we will do is, I know that we've got a bio break, a coffee break, uh, and that was a fantastic presentation, riveting and kept everyone uh, uh, riveted to the end. I loved it, a bit about art and fun and the three pillars. Um, but if people have got additional questions, please go to Slido, please enter them in Slido. Uh, they will be there until 1130. And uh, we will uh, then obviously move to our second, uh, our breakout sessions. So just let me tell you how that's going to work for everyone that's on the uh, webcast. At this moment in time, you're watching me through the main screen. If you scroll down, you will see four boxes underneath this main string called track A, B, C, or D. Each one of those tracks will hold and host a concurrent session based upon your agenda. If you like each particular session or any of these sessions, you click on the go full screen and then you'll be taken into screen much like this here one where you have Slido and you'll be able to ask questions as well. So please at uh, 1130 or 1125, please go to your uh, assigned or prepared uh, track session. Uh, and obviously for the next 10 or 15 minutes, uh, it's 1120, so for the next 10 minutes, uh, please feel free to go to use Slido to ask Minister Audrey Tang any kind of questions you like. And on behalf of the MIT Chief Data Officer Information Symposium, we would greatly like to express our thanks for Minister Tang for putting this presentation together. And uh, we wish Taiwan all the best and all the best to Minister Tang. So thank you. Bio break. <laughs>